Well, thank you very much, everybody. I am going to do what it says on there, past, present, and future. Um, I know an awful lot of what we're talking about today is around information security, cyber risk, and so on. I found it quite telling that I stood around outside the window there while the previous speaker was presenting, talking to the office back in London about one of our retail clients that got hacked this morning, trying to work out whether we need to tell the regulator, whether we need to tell people that their national insurance numbers are out there, etc., etc. And then as I was sat just having my cup of coffee, I've had an email from our office in London saying if you get an email that's headed trip that looks like it's from an employee asking for some money to sponsor her trip, it's not, etc., etc. So it's, it's happening all the time. Uh, I'm not going to talk completely about cyber security. It is going to be about data protection. Uh, and I'm going to talk about where did it come from, uh, where is it now, and where is it going. It's actually nothing new. We've had data privacy uh, way back in the 1800s. A lot of the principles around privacy were English, but also a lot in France. I've given some examples on the slides here of French constitution, Portuguese, etc. Uh, in terms of historical misuse of data, we have to look at what happened during the Second World War. Um, in terms of crypto, uh, you only have to go back to the French Revolution um, to find that there were families that were living in Paris that then suddenly found that they couldn't get out of Paris back to the UK and were communicating using forms of crypto in handwritten letters. I know that because I found one of them at an auction and it's fascinating that 200 years ago you would have somebody <coughs> writing in this but then the Romans did it and the Greeks did it before that. So the concept of trying to keep things secure has been around for a long, long time. And the concepts of us as individuals having rights of privacy and personal data uh, being our sort of DNA has always been around for a long, long time too. Um, and it's interesting that because of, say, the, the uh, Vichy France, the, the whole issue with um, Stasi and Baltic states and Russia, it's why in mainland Europe the concept of whistleblowing in the workforce doesn't tend to happen in reality because if you talk to a French blue-collar worker they will say we do not blow the whistle on one of our colleagues because whistleblowing equates to collaborator, equates to informer and there is still history that prevents it. Interestingly we have completely the opposite view in the UK and indeed we have law that positively expects you uh, to blow the whistle. Of course, moving from manual letters, papers, to electronic is really where things got more complicated. And certainly, uh, we started to see in the 1970s quite a lot of legislation coming through uh, in Europe that was trying to legislate for the ability to protect your personal information or your personal data. And we got our first piece of legislation in the UK in 1984. Back in 1983, when the bill was being drafted, I was a lawyer working in the Midlands, and I was back in the 80s um, specialising in advising computer games companies. So back in about 83, I was probably doing work for Domark, who then went on to become IDOS and Tomb Raider and all of that stuff. And I thought this bill in 1983 about data protection could be quite interesting. There might be a bit of work there for a lawyer like me. I had no idea in 83 that that 1984 Act would go on to become our 1998 Act and would basically mean I do nothing now as a lawyer on a day-to-day -day basis but deal with data protection globally and cyber security and data breaches and so on. It's 
thinking it might be a little interesting was probably an understatement. But it's, it's here, um, and we now have a framework around the world that broadly looks like we have in Europe, except for probably one country only, and that's the US. Almost every other country in the world that has a data protection law tends to do it on a generic basis, whereas the US focus on sectoral approach. And I've just picked three parts of the world up there. I could have talked about Latin America, but by ways of comparison, US, Europe, and Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia has pretty much followed what we do in Europe. As I say, US is slightly different, lots of law, but it's sectoral. There is copper for the children's online privacy. There's HIPAA for health and insurance portability. There's Graham Leach Bliley, which is the law that relates to the banking and insurance sector. The French has one law. The Spanish have one law. We have one law. The Malaysians have one law. The Singaporeans have one law. If you're ever trying to work out what might be the interpretation of data privacy laws in Colombia, uh, in Serbia, uh, in Indonesia, the easy way as a rule of thumb to get a handle on it is to think which old European countries occupied <coughs> other parts of the world in the 1400s, 1600s, 1800s, and you will find that Brazil looks like Portugal, that Colombia looks like Spain, that uh, Dubai's financial center looks like English, Hong Kong looks like English, Macau looks like Portuguese, Vietnam looks like France. It's literally go back, think of the old maps from years back, and that will give you a pretty good rule of thumb as to what looks like what. Hungary looks a bit like Germany, Poland looks a bit like Germany, etc. Um, when you are processing personal data as a business, in the US, businesses there don't have to tell anybody. There's no notification registration requirement. There is in Europe there is in many other parts of the world, like Malaysia, Singapore. Malaysia is a good example where it is a criminal offence to process personal data in Malaysia and not register with the relevant authority. And it carries a fine and a two-year prison sentence for not registering. So not a great place to be doing business in Malaysia and, and get it wrong. Around the world, including the US, we pretty much have a very similar approach to data processing or data collection, and that is, it is unlawful to do it unless you have got some reasonable notice or reasonable consent, whether it's expressed or implied from an individual, that I don't mind you doing that with my information. The US tend not to have quite as bureaucratic approach as we do in Europe or indeed Latin America does or indeed Asia does. But of course in the US there are class actions and we see regularly much more enforcement in the US by the Federal Trade Commission as we call it on businesses that are collecting data with surreptitiously without individuals knowledge etc etc. What we find over here is, is that as we move into a world of ubiquitous computing, Internet of Things, connected autonomous vehicles, big data analytics, most businesses' biggest asset, apart from employees, is all of that information that they have got that they can merge with other information they can buy in from list brokers to data they can scrape off the web, to stuff they can get from cookies and gifts and web technology when you visit websites. With all that data you can do an awful lot of things, but the risk is that with all that data, 
comes the chance that you may equally lose it. And if you're a startup company, you're a Snapchat, or you're some computer games company, or you're a startup information security company, and you're building up data on people, and suddenly you can now get venture capital investment in your business, or it's going even better and you're going to go public, you're going to float on the stock exchange. If one of your biggest assets is all that data that you've got, <coughs> you will find that lawyers like me come along on behalf of the investor and we say, you say your company's worth five million and most of that's the value of your database, but you can't prove to me that you ever got permission from anybody to do what you do with that data in your database so it isn't worth the paper it isn't written on and now I'll buy it off you but not for five million or I'll invest in you but not for five million. So as you start to develop businesses where personal information is a critical asset, for goodness sakes make sure that you've got an audit trail that enables you to understand what it is that you've got, what permissions you've got for the data you collected yesterday, last year, today, tomorrow, and the different uses that you're going to put it to. We're seeing a lot more investigations by regulators into data that is being used for different purposes. You'll have probably seen in the news this morning that the French regulators are investigating Facebook for continuing to move French data from France back to Facebook's headquarters in the US in breach of the French data protection law because what was a safe harbor for transferring data from the EU to the US was struck down in the courts of justice last year and notwithstanding that Facebook have had six months to come up with some other way of doing it they simply have not. And that leads me on to transfers. Data, we know, moves not from A to B like it used to do when you had it in boxes. It moves everywhere to everywhere. Um, and you can push it and you can pull it. The trouble with the cloud, the trouble with the way we use information now is it starbursts everywhere and our data privacy laws are struggling to try and catch up with the way that data moves. But whether we like it or not, Europe takes a very protective attitude towards European citizens' data, and they're currently saying to other countries around the world, including the US, you cannot pull that data from Europe, and our European entities can't push it to you outside Europe, unless there is a framework of some sort in place that gives European citizens adequate protection of their rights. And at the moment, European data privacy law benefits a citizen anywhere in the world if their data is being processed in Europe. US law only benefits US citizens, which is why there's this big political legal debate going on between uh, Europe and the US, particularly post Edward Snowden's revelations about what NSA and GCHQ and others are actually doing with data. And it's not only us, I put up on the screen there that Asia has a not dissimilar approach to restrictions on data transfers and so do a number of countries in Latin America. When we look at things going wrong we're some way behind in Europe the US approach. In the US there is an entire business around data breaches, managing post-incident issues, uh, whereas in Europe we don't yet have uh, as, as complex a data breach, uh, data notification process. But we are getting there. Uh, and you'll see that when the laws change in due course, we will have caught up with what the US is doing, um, and there's an entire industry uh, coming along for managing data breaches in Europe, which doesn't entirely uh, happen yet. 
Another reason that there's going to be an entire new business for anybody sitting out there that is looking to find a new career and is thinking, well, maybe now data privacy or data security is where I want to go, is the US has a history of big style enforcements when people mess up. We've tended not to have that in Europe. Indeed, in the UK, uh, if you breach the UK Data Protection Act, the maximum you can be fined, no matter how egregious it is, is half a million pounds. Nobody's yet been fined more than about 350,000. In America, it tends to be millions and millions and tens of millions, and I think the largest one uh, in early January or late December last year was 100 million on a relatively small startup company that lost loads of people's data because it had no adequate security in place. That 100 million will probably kill that business completely. We don't have that big four by two, as the Americans call it, stick. But we're getting there and that is coming and I'll talk about that in a minute. Asia is following us. They certainly do have prison sentences, again, in Malaysia if you get it wrong and you cause a data breach. But I suspect other parts of the world will catch up. Just before Christmas, Europe announced that they've got a new regulation called the General Data Protection Regulation. Um, those are the URLs where you can find the links to the regulation and the press release. It basically will give us from 2018 one uh, law across Europe uh, that looks the same in relation to how we manage personal data. I've been following it since it was first leaked in 2011 and the version that's now the final version will probably be voted on by the European Parliament in March or April of this year. Uh, it, it's what we expect. Um, it will apply to companies that control personal data, that's the Googles, that's the AstraZenecas, that's the Barclays Bank, but it will, in, in the future, when it comes in, it will apply to third parties that host data or carry out analytics or carry out third-party management of data, and that's different. And it's also going to be extraterritorial, so it will not matter where the business is in the world, even if it doesn't physically have an entity in the EU, if that business in the Cayman Islands is collecting data about EU citizens, then it will be subject to EU law. And that's going to make a, a big, big uh, change to what we are having as opposed to what we get. Consent, the tick the box approach, uh, is going to require a lot more creativity than what we've currently got. One of the things that's in the regulation is interesting is, is that if you go to most websites, you go to Google, you go to Facebook, you go to Pfizer, you go to HSBC and you bother to look at what their privacy policy is and what they say they do with data when you're visiting the website or you're filling in job application forms or whatever, it's usually in such complicated lawyery language that you glaze over and click the whatever button because you want to get on and do business. That's going to change when the new regulation comes in because it basically says if the language of your consent notice or your cookie statement or your privacy policy is not plain language and intelligible, then again, it isn't worth the paper that it isn't written on and you're probably not going to be able to say you validly got people's consent. And I've put on the slide here that when you're dealing with children, it's got to be for teenagers that are using Instagram, Facebook, etc. They're going to be allowed to consent to use those social media platforms, but the language is going to have to be appropriate to the age of the teenager. And if you think what a 13-year-old would understand or comprehend compared with a 17-year-old, that means that a lot of the social media and 
kids facing charities, platforms are going to have to rethink the legal stuff and probably come up with more iconography, more visuals that try to engage people about what do we do with your data, how do we protect your rights, etc. Individuals are going to have far more power over their data. You, you may have seen things in the press about the so-called right to be forgotten, the right of an individual to have old historical of no value information about them deleted from search engines. There's something called a subject access right, which is what we already have now. Any one of us, if we suspect a business is processing our data, can request to know what are you processing about me, and if it's out of date, inaccurate, incorrect, you can get it corrected at almost no expense to you. And we're finding that more and more individuals are be where, becoming aware of this particular right. So businesses that process data are going to have to think far more about what they need to have in place to be able to respond to somebody who is aggrieved as a consumer or aggrieved as an employee and actually answer the question, what do we have about you? When that happens in, in practice nowadays, it becomes hugely problematic to answer a question when a, an employee says, I think that you're planning to sack me. I want to know what you've got about me and how you're going to make that decision. And then the business has to come up with the answer under English law within 40 calendar days of receiving that request. And then the problem is in a big business, whether that big business is a university or it's a, a city council, is, is it on the enterprise-wide network is the business sitting on the HR director's iPhone, iPad, home computer, significant other's shared device, in a manual file in a bottom drawer, in a box in the attic above a lock-up garage, etc. And I quote those because we've seen that in reality, that data is now all over the place. And if you don't know where your data is as a business, you're not going to be able to get it all in in 40 days and deal with that. So again, it's starting to get businesses to think we have to manage personal information far more effectively than we've ever done because it's going to bite us in the proverbial if we get it wrong. Um, businesses, again, are going to have to have, under the new regulation, a greater concept of records management, data management, compliance as a service. Because that's what the new regulation is demanding, is, is you're going to have to embed compliance in terms of how you manage personal data into your activities. You're probably going to have a process around managing personal data as much as you do in the workplace around managing sustainability, diversity, uh, anti-bribery, etc. Um, there's some very detailed stuff on this slide about what data controllers are going to have to do. Um, it's probably not the detail that you need, and I want to move on to a couple of other things before I finish. One other thing is, is that we're going to have to develop what we call privacy impact assessments. Uh, that's going to be interesting across all sorts of different employers or those that are startup companies that are going out with whizzy new technology to screen scrape information, to do data analytics, to use uh, in-car connected devices. Because the, the new law will say every time the business implements a new technology or a new way of doing something with people's information, it has to go stop. What is the impact of the technology or the new way we're going to work with people's information? What is the impact of that on people's privacy, on people's personal data? And if the impact is going to be significant, 
you may have to notify the local regulator what you're doing and what you're doing to protect the security of that information, etc. It's a great new tool which we've not really had and I'll give you a good couple of examples of where in the past something that appears to be an extremely uh, useful technology has the ability to be hugely invasive. So in 1999 I had a client of mine based in the US who made pacemakers. Uh, they came up with the idea of putting a RFID, a radio frequency chip in the pacemaker so that if the pacemaker is malfunctioning, you can swipe yourself, it transmits the data across the network to the hospital and to the manufacturer and you are remotely patched and fixed. Fantastic! Until you realize that back in 99, their technology was doing it over an unsecured AT&T network and it was about that time that a PhD student uh, started talking about how he had got the technology to remotely take over control of a pacemaker much as we hear people now taking over the control of the in-flight devices in aeroplanes uh, and our clients, we were advising them on what security they should put in place. It was interesting that back in 99, 2000, that particular student who had been talking about how he could take control of, of Dick Cheney, uh, one of the uh, American uh, senators' pacemakers, was going to talk at a conference much like this and show people how you do it, but strangely he died the night before. True. Um, Connected autonomous vehicles, smart cars, it's interesting now that if, you're, if you've got a Fitbit or you've got an Apple, some sort of wearable technology, uh, there is no reason with new vehicles in the future why you can't allow the vehicle to take you off the road when you are a diabetes 2 sufferer and you've allowed the car to recognize that your blood sugar level is out of whack. Wouldn't be that be fantastic to be taken to the side of the road and kept safe? But by the same token, we know that unsecured devices would allow somebody else to allow that sufferer to keep on driving until they crash. So a lot of the worry about the fantastic technology is that we need to bake security uh, as a default into these devices. And there's a lot of talk, even right now, in the motor industry as one example, but also in the healthcare sector, even within the last week with a publication in the US of the risks from what we call in vitro devices, etc., etc. We were talking about that in 99, but here we are in 2016 and we still haven't solved those particular risks. I talked about jobs for life. If anybody is thinking of a job for life in business, this could be quite a good one. Most big businesses that process large volumes of personal data under the new regulation are going to have to appoint a data protection officer who will have to have training, uh, autonomy, a, a protected contract can't be dismissed for convenience, would only be dismissed for gross misconduct. Um, and if we follow what the way Germany goes, it's a four-year guaranteed employment for starters. <laughs> there are not enough of these characters out there uh, to actually serve the number of companies that will be caught by this particular law. Um, if you're in business and you're trying to get the management to understand where the risk is, then the big 4 by 2 is up here on the screen, that what was a maximum fine of half a million pounds could be uh, up to 4% of total worldwide turnover for a large company. This is millions, if not billions, for the Googles and so on of this world if they have a major negligent breach, egregious incident, etc. Uh, this, this is a big game changer in the world of privacy that will get a lot of businesses to invest more time. I started by talking about cyber security and I'm going to come towards the end 
and talk about it here. Whilst we have this new regulation coming in in 2018, in parallel to it in Europe, we have this thing called a cyber security directive. That's not entirely the correct name for it, but it's the easiest one that, that I can give everybody. It looks very similar to what the US have, and it's a recognition that there is a lot more risk uh, to the digital economy from nation-state sponsored attacks on systems. So we saw North Korea taking out Sony uh, by injecting malware and attacks into the Sony system. Uh, we've just seen in the last few days an announcement in the US that there has been examples of being able to take out things like utility companies, uh, take over control of air traffic control. Uh, I wrote an article a few years ago called the, the Cyber Tsunami, and I was postulating, and this is all perfectly doable, that if you wanted to cripple London, you would choose a day when there's a particular high tide, <coughs> you would take out the energy uh, electricity supply companies for London, you would trip the Thames barrier so that the water comes up the Thames rather than not going up the Thames, it floods, you have no power in London, there is no stock exchange, there is no Lloyds of London, uh, there is a whole load of stuff that there is none of, and then that's the point at which you can just simply destroy for a period of time a major hub. And that's obviously what this directive is getting us to recognize is that there are what we call in the in Europe market operators, in the US they'd say critical infrastructure companies who are so critical to the infrastructure of the business that they will be forced when this law comes in again in 2018 to impose significantly more information security requirements on themselves, but inevitably it will flow down to everybody that supplies to them. So it's the social media companies, but it's the healthcare sector, it's the banking and insurance sector, it will be a number of the universities that host large research facilities using IBM or Cray computers for massive number crunching. It'll be the Met Office down the road in Exeter, etc. This again will be a whole new industry that is going to require a whole load of input and expertise. And we will have a big change, much like in the US, to breaches which we currently don't have, but that is going to require businesses to have a process in place so that when they have a breach or an incident like my retail company this morning, that they're not having to ring the lawyers up and go help because they already will have a process in place to know who they talk to first. Is it the lawyers? Is it the PR people? Is it the forensics people that are going to come in and find out how did somebody get in to the network, etc. And they're probably going to have invested more in prevention rather than having to deal with the, the cure type scenarios. I've probably depressed everybody up there. I found this particular one uh, in somebody's site the other day, which I quite liked as a warning sign. Um, it is a brave new world that we're getting into. I really didn't think when I said in 1983 to myself, data protection, etc., will be interesting. Uh, but it certainly is interesting. And it certainly is now something that businesses have got to really invest time in. Uh, because it is as important as are we insured, not insured, do we have a business continuity policy, how do we deal with anti-bribery? How do we deal with diversity? It's right in up there and it should be at board level. Uh, that's my belief. Thank you very much, everybody.